Hello and good morning, everyone, and welcome back to today's episode of Log Tech Live. Uh, I'm Eric Johnson. I'm senior technology editor at the Journal of Commerce and also host of Log Tech Live every two weeks on the Let's Talk Supply Chain Network. I'm super glad to be joining you today. Uh, just back uh, this week from our uh, JOC Inland Distribution Conference uh, in Chicago last week. Have a fantastic guest today who uh, was actually a speaker at the event, and we're going to be discussing kind of takeaways from the event along with a whole bunch of other issues in her world. Um, but uh, before we get to our guest, uh, I had a couple things I wanted to um, mention that are upcoming and also some opportunities to get good old fashioned discounts uh, to upcoming JOC events. Um, so first of all, on October 27th, we have a, uh, a webcast about how technology can be a differentiator for 3PLs. Um, we're really focusing on kind of global 3PLs in this one, um, but I think some of the lessons that we're going to discuss are going to apply both to domestic and international 3PLs. Um, really looking forward to this one. This is like right in the sweet spot of everything that I write about and what uh, I talk about often on this show. Um, so definitely tune in if you can. Uh, there's a link to register um, and uh, that that Nicole is popping up here and uh, in the comments, I should say. And it, this one's free to attend. So um, hope to see you there on October 27th. Um, second thing to mention is uh, TPM is not right around the corner, but it'll be here before we know it. Uh, there, we have TPM in early, uh, late February and early March. And right before that, uh, you've heard me mention before TPM Tech, which is February 23rd and 24th in uh, Long Beach. And you can use uh, the code EJTPM25 uh, to get 25% off uh, either uh, registrations for TPM Tech, TPM, or a bundle uh, for the two. So hope to see you in Long Beach in February. Uh, we'll be updating uh, the agenda fairly soon, and we'll be updating kind of you on all the cool stuff that we're doing. We have some really cool ideas this year at both events that we've, things we've never done before. Um, so that's, that's that. Um, and now let's, uh, let's go into our normal news of the week. Uh, I'm just going to run through a few things that kind of caught my eye or, uh, that I wrote about this past week. Um, so the first story is something that's super relevant, um, to actually our discussion later today, uh, which is, uh, kind of what's going on with, uh, the LTL technology world. So this was a session, uh, a topic that we covered in a session at the Inland Conference last week. We had three great uh, panelists, one of whom, Curtis Garrett, was a was a guest on this show a few months back. Um, we also had uh, Michael Bookout from My, My Carrier and Lance Healy, a true pioneer of, of pricing uh, technology in the LTL world. Uh, he's with Optum. So, I did a story uh, earlier this week about the try to capture some of the the high level takeaways from that session because um, there were a lot. It, it was a thirty minute session, but there was a lot of great info about kind of where progress has been made in terms of LTL tech, uh, where it still needs to be made, and so some sort of historical roadblocks to why adoption has not been greater. All sort of with this undercurrent that LTL demand is, you know, has really increased during the pandemic and is sort of on this trend line of, of increasing further. So even if there's a temporary kind of lull right now, uh, seasonality wise. So in this, uh, I think the really important thing to think about with, with regards to this story is um, each of the panelists kind of came up with their quote unquote moonshot ideas. Um, and, and I thought Curtis's sort of encapsulated everything really nicely in that he just wanted to see the industry be easier for people to sort of jump into for the first time and not have to go through kind of 10 years of battle scars um, and, and learn the ins and outs of it before really understanding and being super proficient at it. So I thought that was really interesting, you know, to have it be kind of a more plug and play experience for, you know, a new e-com seller or uh, someone in the industrial sector that wants to take advantage of, uh, of LTL as a, as a mode. So um, really encourage you to read that story that was out uh, earlier this week on JOC.com. Um, the next story I wanted to highlight was one that I wrote about yesterday, um, but actually the it first came out in Business Insider yesterday. Um, this was uh, Altana, uh, a, uh, a company that 
doesn't really fit neatly into any software category bucket that exists right now. You could call them kind of a global trade management in that category. Um, you could put them in the sort of machine learning automation category. I sort of think of them as trying to build a, 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 a network or a map of the world supplier network all the way, you know, way upstream beyond like initial kind of tier one suppliers, but to the sort of subcontractors, sub suppliers that those that those um, suppliers use so that the, the shipper has an idea of who they're working with way upstream, right? Um, so it's a very interesting company. We actually had Amy Morgan, head of trade compliance at Altana on our last show um, three weeks ago, I think it was. So um, definitely encourage you to revisit that episode in light of them getting a pretty healthy um, uh, funding round this year, uh, uh, sorry, this week. Uh, and that's in a year where really, uh, you know, th this is this is not the environment where VCs are doling out $100 million uh, funding rounds like they were a year ago. So super interesting um, and definitely encourage you to kind of check out the episode from last week and also um, find out a little bit more about what Altana is trying to do. Uh, very interesting company. So, and like I said, uh, this is a great story, delves in a little bit more to the sort of origins and, and big picture vision of of uh, Altana written by Emma Cosgrove, who also was a guest on our show uh, earlier this summer. Um, so you can check out the, the conversation I had with uh, Emma at Business Insider as well. Um, and then my story also kind of pieces together some of the coverage that um, I've done on Altana before. So um, with that, let's go to the next, uh, the next thing I wanted to highlight, which was, um, so my newsletter last week, not the one that just posted um, an hour or so ago, my newsletter last week was about whether product led growth sort of fits into the um, into the the structure of the logistics market, uh, or whether this will be a market that it just sort of continues to be more sales led uh, in terms of growth. These are this is a term I'm all, I'm learning. I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm definitely not an early stage founder. You know, looking at blitz scaling any business. Um, so I've had to learn, learn this myself on the fly. Um, but it was interesting. This actually came about in a, another session at, at Inland last week that involved, uh, Felipe Capella, who is uh, CEO of LoadSmart. And there was actually a really good question from the audience that came, uh, asking this exact question. Can, you know, can logistics sort of move into a product led growth phase? Um, and, and Felipe had an interesting answer. He said, look, it's the, the market as he sees it is not set up to be um, product led uh, from a growth perspective. It's, it's a sales business. You have to be in front of the customer. It's a long sales cycle. There's a lot of trust that needs to be built. This is not something that people go out, hit a button, give their credit card information and just start using right away. Um, so not to say that there aren't some applications where this, you know, sort of that that kind of growth could occur but right now this is a market where it's a sales cycle and t tends to be long sales cycles and and that's the way to grow so i think the question i posed toward the end of the the newsletter last week was can the sales led growth efforts start to accelerate so they look a little bit more in terms of pace like the product -led, like product led growth does in other industries and especially b2c um remains to be seen. But, you know, I think everything is accelerating a little bit. And, and as new kind of buyers come into the market, um, you know, we'll, we'll, younger generation starts to like appreciate different forms of being uh, of, of adopting technology, we may see that sort of happen, you know, just innately rather than someone deciding, oh, we need to switch to product like growth now. So lots, uh, lots more to, to kind of figure out uh, on the uh, on this uh, topic as we go forward, but um, I'm going to now stop my monologue and bring on someone who knows a lot more about the LTL industry and trucking in general than I ever will. Uh, Samantha Jones with Rocket Shipping. Samantha, Good morning. So glad you I, could join us today. Thank you. I appreciate the compliment. I don't know that if I know more than you ever will, Eric. We believe in you. I I have never moved a single pallet or container of freight. So I really cannot say that I know more than my guests and I have to be very honest with the audience. So um, my job is to bring really smart people to this uh, 
to, to this show. So, so glad you could join us, Samantha. Um, do you want to maybe um, give us a little bit of background on your, just sort of how you got into logistics and how you ended up at Rocket? Okay, yes. <laughs> so I think every single person you ask, how did you get into logistics? They all say it just happened because it's true for the most part. Um, I, I did just kind of come into this industry right out of college. I was recruited at a career fair, um, started as a management trainee, and then went into outside sales, did outside sales for almost a couple of years, and um, got to work with a lot of small to medium sized shippers, um, just helped them in any way I could with either assets or technology, whatever that looked like. And then I tr transitioned into a director of enterprise sales role, which was a ton of fun because I got to work with all of the Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 shippers um, in North America and um, companies that operated global supply chains as well. So just got to learn a lot more about what's important at these um, larger scale levels. And during that time, I realized that um, can't you can't fake smart <laughs> to these people as much. And um, not that I wanted to. So I started educating myself a lot more, trying to connect with more people like Eric Johnson, uh, following his articles on LinkedIn, um, but just started getting really interested in the idea of global and domestic markets and how those impact the freight markets, um, understanding economics and how that correlates to the trends that we see in our industry. So that's been my focus for the last couple of years. And I started expressing that on LinkedIn, doing content on LinkedIn, kind of centered around that. Um, and through that, I met Gabe, who's the CEO of Rocket Shipping, and um, just kind of started a conversation around, hey, I like what you're doing with video. Like, I like what you're doing with video. And you know, he was like, hey, do you want to work for me? And I said, no way. And then just gave it a couple more months. And here I am. So I'm the vice president of revenue at Rocket Shipping now. And, and just real briefly, what is rocket shipping? Just so people who don't, uh -huh. don't know that name understand. Yep. Yep. Good saying. question. Uh, we're a third party logistics company. We're really quickly growing, which is awesome and exciting. And so we specialize in what we would call a modern approach to managed LTL transportation and technology. And now we are also um, taking a lot of the success and practices that we've seen on that side. And we are establishing our um, independent full truckload brokerage that will run under Rocket Logistics. So we have a lot going on and it's really exciting. Yeah, cool. There's so much going on in LTL right now. This really feels like a crazy, in a, in a good way, crazy year of like a real inflection point. And we'll definitely get to that. I have to say your comment about like, showing the market that you know what you're talking about totally resonates with me. I got thrown into, I got thrown into a role that was sort of like over my head early on yeah. in my, in my reporting career, like writing about container shipping to people who knew who had been doing it for decades mm -hmm. uh, and had their lives and literally hundreds of millions of dollars at stake in their, in their job. And you learn really quickly when you know what you're talking about and when you don't, because they point it out to you. So right. Uh, totally identify with that. Yeah. Um, so let, before we get into anything else, I do want to talk about, you just moved into this role, what, in August, something like that, right? So, yeah. mm -hmm. and you came from ArcBest, correct? Mm -hmm. So what has, which is massive, obviously well-known LTL provider, what, what's the shift been like going from a relatively big, well-known player in the market to a smaller one that is like growing and but you know yeah. part of that it's okay to say not as well known because we we're gonna take that as a challenge and soon yeah. it's gonna know totally. who we are that's so. the challenge right um, that's what brought you on yeah no i mean for me it's been exactly what i had hoped it would be and it's been everything that i knew was going to be which is why i made the change um i think that there is something really awesome about a small company that has um, leaders who have their mindsets in the right place. Um, we want to not just do things the way they've all, always been done. And everybody wants, I would hope, to have that like innovative spirit. But with organizations of scale, it's so much harder to change at a quicker pace. Um, and so you have to try to always be thinking five years ahead with these big organizations because it takes so long to transition technologies or whatever processes, whatever that looks like. And so one of our um, you know, advantages right now in the market is our agility because we are young, we are growing. We're trying to think about five years ahead right now and we're trying to create that right now and it's a lot easier for us to do that. So not only does that put us in a good position today, 
but we're hoping that we're going to be always on the forefront, you know, in the next two, three, four, five years. So um, that's been fun. And then just getting to be in a position where I get to be more involved with actually growing the business um, and, and, and leading some strategy personally was was a really fun experience for me to step into as opposed to um, like strictly a sales role. Yeah, I can imagine it's it's a big challenge, big responsibility, but it's like got to be so satisfying to be like more directly involved. I, you know, I think as I as I look as I sort of scan out, it's really interesting, right? I one of the things I think about from especially from a shipper perspective that sort of emerged across almost every transportation mode is the range of options now has just exploded, right? It's always been a fragmented market, but it tended to be fragmented with a lot of similar type of players who had marginal differences between each other. But yeah. in almost every mode, almost every type of, of 3PL, you can go to a really established name and you know what you're gonna kind of what you're gonna get from them, but you can also go to like a whole bunch of smaller companies that are super nimble. Some of them are like traditionally focused and others are more like, no, we are really tech forward, really think we're trying to rethink this industry. So it's it's cool and confusing from a shipper perspective to have all these options. But <laughs> that's I mean, fair. That's a very fair assessment. Yeah. And I would say that, you know, just to that point, um, you have your like, especially in the LTL industry, you have the asset providers and then you have all the brokers, and then you have the TMS providers. Um, and some of them might do two of those. Some of them might do all of those. Some of them might do just their one part of that. So trying to navigate that. And, um, you know, what I would say is what we have done again, talking about like trying to be agile is we don't like put a box around our customers and we say, how do you want to do this? Like we'll be as involved or as uninvolved. Do you want strictly our SaaS solution? Do you want us that to come with management and carrier management? Do you want us to hold your tariffs for you? Do you want to hold your tariffs directly with your carriers and let us manage those relationships? So we just kind of approach this as understanding that literally in our industry, there's kind of been this big box broker idea where you can go with like this one big broker and you just kind of go all in there and you take the can tech they give you and you take the management and the flat rates they give you or you can try to go directly to the asset providers and handle all these negotiations and then you have to try to go find a different tms solution or there's that maybe that person that's now creating something in the middle where you can kind of do a mix and match of whatever works best for you, but it can all live within one provider and, and in one place. And so that's what we call modern LTL logistics management. And that's what rocket shipping is focused on. Cool. That's a good description. Hopefully that was helpful framework yeah. for people. It certainly was good for me. Put my scattered <laughs> thoughts on this into like a better framework. Um, so let's talk about you specifically. So you had mentioned you were reading my stuff mutual admiration society here. I, I don't even know when I first read something from you, but I was like, Whoa, okay. This is a new face on the scene talking really <laughs> about helping me understand a part of the industry that I was struggling to understand in the way that I needed to. So you've been on fire on LinkedIn this year. What was sort of the thought process in being more vocal and prominent and, and sort of like, what are your general thoughts about like building a brand through that type of activity? Yeah. So the number one most important thing to me for building a brand, especially like on a social media, like a LinkedIn page is don't try to attempt to do something you're not passionate about. Um, I know as nerdy and as dumb as it might sound like that's, I was sharing this information because I was literally over here, like, geeking out on trying to learn this stuff myself. And so I was passionate about it. I was putting hours of my time into it. And I really what triggered the thought to share it was like, hey, I'm spending so much time trying to find this information, learn this for myself. Why would I like keep that to myself when I knew from from working with my peers, working with my customers, um, that not everybody has that much time to be doing this. So it's like, I can take what I've learned, put it in like some easily to digest, either read it, you can listen to it, something like that on a LinkedIn post. And hopefully somebody else benefits from what I was doing too. So that's what kind of got me to start sharing content. Um, And then it also, if you notice, like a lot of my content isn't like, hey, look at me, look what I know, I'm gonna teach you something. It's like, hey, look at all these other great people 
the, in this industry who, who bring valid points, who have good information. And I'm really just trying to like, oftentimes I'm aggregating sources for people and putting it out there. So um, maybe you don't have time to read 10 different articles that day, but you have time to read my one LinkedIn post. And that's kind of the hope. Yep. Yeah, that's, I, I think uh, it's, it becomes pretty apparent as a huge consumer and part-time producer of, uh, of stuff that goes out in various channels. <laughs> it's super apparent when someone is coming with a very like humble approach to this, like, Hey, I know a lot about certain things, but there's this huge world where, mm -hmm. I mean, you're just, if you want to be, you can always be learning something new versus the people who are like, this is the way the market is. Yeah. I know it to be a fact consume my stuff because I am amazing, right? And so I would like to, just to that point, I'm, I'm of the opinion that nobody really knows as much as they like to come off as they know. And for obvious reasons, but also I think that the smartest people out there are people who, when you talk to them, you go, oh my gosh, they sound like they know what they're talking about. I'm going to be willing to bet that most of the stuff that they just said to you was an aggregation of talking with 10 other people and listening. Totally. So like we're, you have to be able to listen to what other people say and pull little bits and pieces of that into what you do. So if you look at my like, you know, my market update videos or my posts that I share, you know, I have writers from JOC, from Wall Street Journal, from Freight Waves, from like all these different sources, because I, I don't believe that there's you should ever just be within one channel. You need to be willing to look around you and, and you know glean some things from other people. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, that's what I would say. Just be wary of any one person who seems way too confident that they have all the answers because <laughs> I don't think that's ever the case. Yeah, totally, totally agree with you on that. I think it's uh, it's super important. And I, I've stressed this a bunch, like, please do not believe every single word I said, I say without like, you know, talking to other people about it or disagreeing with me like yeah that's but that's the it. beauty of journalism too is that that's how you write is by talking with other people right now you need to totally. have to go out and, and talk with people and get other people's opinions and so yep. um, that's what makes yeah. it so awesome yeah you're right my job is definitely to not take the word of one person and like just run with it and not verify with other people's yeah. perspective so um, yeah, it's been just super interesting and and I have to constantly be like oh I'm really persuaded by this person. I have to like <laughs> step back and go, okay, why am I persuaded? Should I be challenging, you know, mm -hmm. the, that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. super interesting to hear your thought process on that. Um, so let's switch to inland, uh, which I've referenced and you, you, I think mentioned as well. So we had this, this conference last week in Chicago, you were a panelist on the very last session, which <laughs> yeah. was a fantastic session about it was very solutions oriented. It was mm -hmm. very pragmatic. It was not like abstract, you know, collaboration is the key. Yeah. You know, like, you know, <laughs> yep. to do this, this, and this, if you want to be served better. Yeah. Um, and so what, what were your sort of high level takeaways, both from that session, but just the, the conference in general? So conference in general um, was, really informative for me because admittedly in the last few months, I haven't been as closely involved in like anything on the rail side. Um, not even so much on the international since that's not services that uh, rocket shipping offers right now. So um, that was really cool for me. I opening. I learned a lot about the rail that I never knew, even when I was with ArcBest who, who offers services. Um, I sat in on some of the like think tank sessions to hear of like the shippers, which I think was so cool, right? You hear the shippers and the rail, um, they, we even had the rail representatives there like hashing out, how can we try to fix this in Kansas City and Memphis and, um, you know, Chicago. So that was really interesting. I got to hear more about like the warehousing side of things, which, you know, I'm not boots on the ground in warehouses right now. So um, hearing about this unique struggles that they're facing and those types of things, that was really interesting. Um, I enjoyed that. And I think that you know, that's what one of the biggest benefits of conferences like this are, is that everybody you know, of course, I made sure I attended the ones about surface transportation, about um, truckload and LTL, because that's what I live within. And you, I still learn stuff. But being able to just dip your toes into something new that you don't immerse yourself in already every day is really exciting to me because um, 
I believe that in supply chain, you need to have like a pulse on kind of the whole big picture, not just one specific mode that you dive into and tune out the rest. So that was my one of my favorite things about just the overall conference. And then of course, networking. I love networking. So just talking to as many people as I could. Um, that was a lot of fun. And then our panel specifically, I, I agree with you. I think um, I'm not a fan of just like buzzwords and saying things that sound good. And so um, I was hopeful that I was able to give some tangible, um, you know, recommendations to shippers and to carriers um, and third party providers and how we can all be working together um, and how shippers can actually get the most benefit out of those relationships. Yeah. And I, I have another, hold that thought because I have another question I want to throw at you later <laughs> in the discussion about your panel in particular, because it was something that stood out. But um, yeah, I, I think one of the things we go into every conference when we set it up is how can we help people contextualize? Like, so even if you're only in one mode or one region, like what do, what does, you know, rail gridlock mean to other modes, right? What does ocean constraints mean to the truck trucking world, right? So that's definitely what we set out to accomplish. So I'm glad to hear that it was beneficial from to you from that perspective. Let's um let's go into the market a little bit, right? This has been you you know you do your market updates, um you are ear to the ground with customers uh, and uh, and with carriers. It, to my view, this has been a really weird, messy, noisy market this year. Um, lots of conflicting sort of signals, data wise, anecdotal. How do you sort of make sense of this? How do you cut the signal from the noise? Um. There's a lot of noise. That's true. <laughs> I think the way we can do our best to make sense of things is to just keep looking at data and not just playing off of emotions. Um, but you also have to understand that depending on where you're at geographically, depending on the industry you service, on um, the products that you produce or ship, like everybody does have that different feel. And if you live within like just your bubble, what's happening to you in that moment might feel like it's what's happening in the overall economy or the overall freight markets. It's usually not the case. So I think it's very important to always step back and at least have that like 10,000 foot view of what's going on. Um, which is kind of what I attempt to do in my market updates is like, let's look at this big picture. And when I show the overall average of drive in spot rates on a graph, like I did this morning when I recorded it, someone who's shipping in Florida right now might feel a little bit differently or someone who's shipping in California might feel a little bit differently. So um, it, there is value in just taking a step back and looking at the overall market and what's going on. As far as market trends, I would say we can you believe that like 2019 was almost what three to four years ago? Like that's so long ago now. And we keep saying pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic, that's starting to become like, you know, just it's, it's gonna be not not something that we can say anymore because just by nature of how we should have progressed over the course of three years, three years, had we stayed on a normal trend line, we would not be back at 2019 levels. Right. So um, people keep talking about that. But every year that we move, as we move into 2023 now, we went through um, three years of pandemic, post pandemic recovery. And so I don't think we're, we need to stop talking about we're going to be back at 18, 19 levels. Like that's going to be a permanent like trend moving forward. Yep. Um, so just keeping, that in mind. And then we climbed up a really steep mountain in 2020, 2021. And so we have to come back down and we might That's come down so and find that the valley on the other side is maybe a little higher ground than the valley was on the other side. Um, yeah. That would kind of be my thought, just again, based on the timeline that's playing out here. But keeping everything in context, this is everything that's happening right now with the softening should have been 1000% predictable. Right. And so you have to keep that in context that so we knew this was coming. This was to be expected. And so it, it doesn't necessarily have to be indicative of, you know, horrible market crashes and things. Um, and then if you want to get a little bit farther, start paying attention to the economy, start paying attention to what's happening with inflation, with the U.S. dollar, um, with consumer behaviors, with oil prices, things like that. Um, they do affect your truckload rates, your LTL rates. So... <laughs> So a couple of interesting things. I think the three year the th the three year sort of cycle has always been in my mind around the pandemic because I read something early, like in twenty mid twenty that said, look, if you look historically at pandemics, 
no matter what the technology and the medicine was like historically, they take three years to resolve, right? Mm -hmm. to, to make, you know, for things to return to whatever normal is. Um, so I've always had in the back of my head, like April of 23, as kind of the time that like people stop saying pre pandemic is what we need to, you know, it's like, no, we need to move on now. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, not to say that people aren't still suffering with this, but like, that's when I think we can stop, draw a line under this. And so it will be interesting. And at that point, the other thing I wanted to point out, super interesting for you to take the view that you, you know, your particular experience isn't necessarily indicative of the way the market is because you're, dealing with customers with those those anecdotes and you're trying to help them understand the context mm -hmm. i sort of have the, i have the opposite problem like we get a lot of average data mm -hmm. we have cut we have readers who say oh but this average data is not indicative of all of my experience right so yeah. it's i think it's being able to look up and down at those high level and on the ground kind of like individual things that's super yes. important right so, so one super just like starch example of this right now would be the cost of a container from Asia to the West coast right now. Oh, my favorite topic. Like think of how much the volume has dropped off, but there is still a lot of volume over there. So someone's still importing containers for whatever it is now, 2000 to $3,000 per TU. And then someone is still importing New York, you know, New Jersey and all these East Coast and Gulf ports. Uh, Savannah has 40 ships anchored there, right? So someone's still paying for the rate from Asia to Savannah, but now also all the costs incurred with dwell times and 0.1% warehouse vacancy in the Port of Savannah's area. So Somebody is able to take advantage of these low spot rates. Um, some of those people, though, might also be shipping in on contract rates to the West Coast still that are not as attractive as those spot rates. So there's probably a very small percentage of people right now, if I had to guess, who are actually reaping the benefits of the low spot rate to the West Coast from Asia. Like, vast majority of people are not seeing that. Right. But that is like in headlines everywhere. Like, look at this price. And so then they might be thinking like, oh, my gosh, are people saving this much money? Are people doing this? Um, no, probably not. So it's just like one of those things of like taken in context. Somebody is though, and they're like, this is great. Their executives might be saying like, oh, we're set. We're going to save all this money. But as the pendulum swings back to the West Coast, if they stay on the West Coast, then that's going to be a short, short lived reality for them. So that's why yeah. it's important to pay attention to that big picture. That's great. I, that's a whole nother show unto itself. And maybe <laughs> yes, I need to revisit that or visit that issue. Um, but um, yeah, great perspective on that. Well, let, let's maybe get specifically more into LTL because we had a couple interesting conversations at um, at the Inland event. One sort of like about market, the other that I led that I referenced uh, on technology. Um, so we, I think of this in terms of like, is the market ready for the growth that it's experienced and will experience in the future? And specifically, you know, kind of, making it easier for co uh, companies that hadn't really considered LTL before or, or, you know, they're new to shipping entirely and they're like, oh, this is actually the right mode for me to be in, but I have no experience, right? Yeah. How do you sort of think about those types of companies and, and is the industry ready to sort of accommodate them? Yes. So it's actually interesting because I would say that rocket shipping, um, we have a really strong niche in the e-commerce space, which obviously was really popular the last few years. And it's it's still here to stay because e-commerce is a matter of consumer buying patterns and convenience, right? Um, but a lot of the customers that we partner with on our e-commerce um, solution are people who are like, hey, I started making custom high-end furniture and now it's really like blown up and I want to be able to be shipping my couches like all over the U.S., but how the heck do I ship a couch? <laughs> and so then like, that's where, you know, we're able to step in and help them with that. But um, yeah, being able to not be limited by shipping restrictions or not understanding the market of LTL. Um, I, I would say that that is a strong suit of third party logistics companies. Um, they can be positioned there to help educate and help manage those processes for these people, these shippers who otherwise are not familiar with the industry of LTL. Um, and rather than, you know, hiring five people on their team just to manage it, then that's when they find value in partnering with someone um, 
to help them with that process. And then it's kind of like a, it's a benefit to the carriers as well too, right? Because that third party logistics company understands the carriers. They, there's going to be a seamless um, on board of that shipper with those carriers because the person in the middle knows how to facilitate that uh, integration with the carrier to that shipper. So specifically like in the e-commerce space for these new people getting into shipping LTL, um, I think that that's definitely where a third party provider can add a lot of value to both the carrier and the shipper in that situation. Um, I cut my teeth in LTL. Like I, I started on a freight dock for six months. I've seen how LTL operates and it is. And then, and then I worked over 300 pricing tariffs, probably in, at least in my career. So I understand the complexities of it. And if you've had it, you've had Curtis Garrett on here <laughs> and he can nerd out about all the complexities about that. Um, and that's what makes it challenging. It's not the same as a lot of other modes. And so there's a lot to learn there. And I like Curtis's idea of having a quicker learning curve, but still a lot of information to take in. So I think we'll see continued progression of um, hopefully the industry trying to make it a little bit more simplistic as we're kind of moving from this um, weight based concept to space based concept. How do we balance that? How do we make that a little bit easier to understand? Um, NMFCs, you know, those, how do we kind of try to start working on simplifying those processes? So. There's a lot to be said about the direction that we could move as far as improvements go in the LTL space. Well, I don't think, uh, I think Curtis, um, I don't think I asked him this directly, but I don't think he would presume that tech is the answer for all this, right? Like the yeah. 3PL, it can be the like Rosetta Stone for making things easier for both the shipper and the carrier, right? So um, through yeah. service, right? So well put. Um, and, and another, you know, kind of, another example of like why intermediaries will not be disintermediated anytime soon um right so um in fact i think they've probably gained more popularity in the last yeah year. yeah no i mean i this that's a theme that we've talked about a lot on this show uh, in various yeah. you know modes so um let's quickly get into uh your panel specifically and something you mentioned frequently just to make sure that everyone was very clear uh, I think you said the word data like 20 times. Just I think it was like four. Ooh, four. Okay. <laughs> but it stood out because you were like, just remember that's yeah. what did you what did you focus on in terms of like shipper, just so people like can are clued into what you talked about in terms of shippers um understanding their own data better and being and using that to be better customers essentially. Yeah, so there's definitely a reason that I emphasized and maybe overemphasized that, but that's because sometimes I think we don't talk about like the most basic part of what needs to happen to see change. So if you want to talk about, oh, you need to diversify your carrier base, you need to um, better understand like your freight profile, you need to understand if you're doing a bunch of single shipments, then try to consolidate those into one pickup for that LTL carrier, you know, maybe ship every two days, every three days. That's all like, those are all great suggestions. We had a lot of really great suggestions that came up on that panel, but literally none of those are possible to even identify unless you have data. How do you know you ship single shipments all the time? There, are, I mean, Eric, there are shippers out there who ship multiple pallets to the same receiver in a day and put them on separate BOLs because they're just like, if two orders come in, one in the morning and one in the you know, mid at mid morning from the same um, customer, they've just processed them as separate orders and out they go as two individual pallets yeah. to be able to, like it's, there's so many things that people are like, well, why would you do that? You would never do that if you knew that was happening. Correct. You wouldn't do that if you knew that was happening, what but you, you can't look at your data. You know, that's, they probably did not have the data to understand that. So um, the most basic level of all of this is, having your data and your data as a shipper is absolutely what empowers you. Like that puts you in control. That helps you understand how to make decisions. That helps you come to the table with something to offer, to have educated conversations with the carriers direct, with the third party logistics provider, whoever that is with maybe even with your customers, maybe with your vendors, like, Hey, look what you shipped to me. Hey, look what you bought for me and how you bought it. Can we maybe focus on aggregating all of your orders into every Thursday since you're cluster ordering on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And like, you know, who knows what that might look like, but you can't have any of those conversations until you can understand your data and what's going on. Yeah. 
are there is there a specific um like tools or is it like literally can it be a spreadsheet like what's the best way to like get started on that yeah that's that's the biggest problem and the reason that so many cut and like this is not exclusive to small shippers like i've i'm i oh, came yeah. from working with fortune 500 companies who who don't have good data um and they're moving millions and millions of dollars to ltl or, or truckloads so Again, that kind of goes back to my point where the larger companies of scale, it's harder to change. To transition into a new ERP system, a new WMS, a new TMS system, whatever it is that they would need to help them aggregate and collect that data might be a two-year process and it might cost them millions of dollars. But it should have started two years ago. And so yeah. if you haven't started it today, you're just perpetuating the inevitable because eventually it's just, I mean, it already doesn't make sense, but it's going to happen at some point. It will make less sense in two years. Yeah. 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 So no, but usually it is a hindrance um, from technology and processes. Uh, some shippers are, oh, we're just so crazy. We don't even have time to create BOLs or, or quote any of our stuff or put it in a TMS. We literally just get the orders. We pick it. We throw it on a drop trailer and it goes out. And they have no idea what they're spending on those shipments until after they get invoices. Right. So um, and then that's the other thing is like carriers. There's no as nice as it would be. Not all carriers collect the same information. So understanding the space that you take up on a trailer is very important. If you don't notate your dimensions, a lot of carriers will not. And you will never know the dimensions of the stuff that you have shipping out to create a density profile. Things are density based. Your NMFCs or your classes are density based, but you don't know your density if you don't know your dimensions. And um, so it's it's a and you, and you can't rely on you can't rely necessarily on the carriers to provide that info. You might think that you can, but yeah, that's yeah. No, and I mean I came from so when I came from a carrier, ABF freight is is space based pricing. Period. So yeah. if you did not include dimensions on your order, the dock or the driver was required to get a tape measure, measure it, input them, and it would go in the system. So I don't know how many carriers do that, but probably very few. And so we were one of few who like, yes, if we exported all of your information of historical data, we could see your true freight profile because we collected all of that information. But most carriers, I would say, don't. And so even if you're like, okay, well, I want my data now. So I'm going to go to my carrier partners and ask them, export all my data that you have on my shipment profiles. What you're going to get back, every single format is going to be different. So if you try to consolidate that all into one Excel to take out to a bid, you're going to have a whole lot of guesswork in there and it's a close enough and it's, and that doesn't fly in LTL. So the carriers, then what happens when you make them guess is they assume that they're taking your risk because they might think they're getting one thing and then you give them another and it costs entirely different. And so they just pad, they have to pad all their margins to assume the risk that you're asking them to take. And so then you cannot ever get the most effective um, costing that you would be able to otherwise have if you had good data, it just won't happen. Unless you, mentioned, you you mentioned that on the panel, right? Yeah. Is like every every bit of uncertainty you have turns into risk for the carrier, which they will translate into margin. And to take, to somebody offset. else beat me to this, but I have to say this: people who are like, "Oh, we we have you know an incumbent, but we still test the market and we still send out an RFP." If you send out bad data to ten carriers who have no historical data on you and ask them to price it. 10 out of 10 times, they will be less aggressive than the carrier that's already running for you that has your exact data and profile and can price it. So yeah. you're going to just get fooled into thinking that you're in the right position. And you are probably absolutely not. In fact, most of the time, if one carrier has a majority of your freight, you're not in the right position. Very interesting. Fantastic stuff. Everyone who waited till the end of the show got some awesome nuggets <laughs> here. Um, so last question before uh, I have to let you go. Who's your favorite band or musician? Uh, and you have to tell me why. Oh, darn. Okay. I, I good, you right? actually, you told me you were going to ask me this and then I forgot um, to think ahead on it. You're too, you're too much logistics, not enough music. Come on. I know, I know. Okay. So I grew up on classic rock, classic country, and some like gospel mixed in there. And that's what, that's what I grew up on. But I still do like classic rock. I still do really like country. Um, I feel like people are going to have really strong opinions over this because so many people are divided on whether they like them or not. But I'm a fan of new country music. Um, I live in Kansas, so I feel like people have to give me a break. Okay. Totally understand. But um, yeah, I would say 
they're, they're just not as well known. I really like a smaller artist named Ian Munsick. Um, I like enjoy Morgan Wallen, who's pretty well known. Um, and then some of the more bigger musicians, Jason Aldean and some of those. So I'm a country music girl. It's a great, it's a great environment. It's a great vibe. You get out in the summer, you get to go, you know, outside and, and listen to music. And yeah, I mean, country goes pretty well with trucking, right? I don't think that's a too big a stretch. So, um, yeah. and those are great, great. I, I like when people bring up artists that maybe people hadn't heard of us, so we can open yeah. our, expand our horizons. Um, <laughs> This has been an awesome discussion. Uh, really enjoyed it. And thank you so much for making time. Thank you for being at Inland last week. And um, people can follow you on LinkedIn. Uh, Nicole put up your profile. Easy to find. She's she's everywhere these days. Um, and definitely check out Rocket Shipping if you get a chance. Thank you so much for joining us today, Samantha. Thanks, Eric. Bye. All right. Well, we have just enough time for my usual bad dad joke of the week uh so this one and i blatantly stole this from twitter i forget who posted it but it's mine now uh did you hear about the awful story about the dad who played peekaboo with his kid they had to take him to the icu it's pretty good right I can't blame that one on my son. This is this is one I found on my own. So uh, if you don't like it, I'm going to connect you with, I'm going to find out who posted this and I'll connect you with them. If you like it, then I came up with it. Um, thank you everyone who showed up. Thank you, Samantha. Awesome discussion. Definitely encourage you to reach out to her um, if you want to follow up uh, on anything she said. You know where to reach me on Twitter, LinkedIn, joc.com. Definitely encourage you to use that code uh, for TPM and TPM Tech. And thank you as always to uh, the audience. Thank you for supporting this show. It's so much fun to do it. I do it for you guys. And obviously thank you to Sarah and Nicole and the team at Let's Talk Supply Chain for making this so easy for me. Uh, we will see you in two weeks, October 21st. I have an awesome guest lined up for that as usual. Uh, enjoy the rest of your uh, Friday and have a great weekend, everyone. See you next time.